Romans chapter 13, and we're going to pick up just by way of review. We've been looking at uh, slow to anger, and we started in, in Proverbs 16 and verse 32, uh, how the Bible says there that we should, we should be slow to anger, and we've, we're looking at having an acrostic where we're going S-L-O-W, and that was don't stress, and that was the first thing we covered, and then the second one was don't lust. And the one we're up to now is the O, which is don't owe. And uh, um, Romans chapter 13 and verse number 8 uh, there, the, the Bible says, and this is to, to help with your anger and being slow to anger, Romans chapter 13 and verse 8. Romans 13 and verse 8, the Bible says there, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And so uh, when it goes along with just some practical advice and biblical advice when it comes to this idea of being slow to anger and being in control of your spirit and those things, one of the things that contributes to uh, a problem with your anger and temperament is people that get in debt uh, and un unnecessarily they get in debt, they stay worked up all the time. And uh, you say, why? They can't seem to get the monkey off their back. And, uh, and so they're constantly angered by their financial obligations. They're on edge they're, um, and the limitations that go with it. And, and the thing is, is that, that, that that's a hard thing to, to get out of once you're in it. Those in debt are more uptight than those who are debt free. Uh, you say, why? You're not, you're not owing anybody anything. And trouble in finance remains one of the top reasons why so many uh, marriages end in divorce. Uh, the last statistics that I read uh, said that was the number one indicator uh, of uh, a divorce uh, being imminent and taking place was because financial trouble and, and connected to debt. And so it's a, it's a bad thing. Stay away from it and uh, watch out with that. And so before you measure, measure your credit worthiness, you'd better consider your anger management And when it comes to these things. Uh, look over there from uh, Romans 13. Look at uh, Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. The Bible says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And so you have to be careful with, this, uh, with, with debt when it comes to these things as well, because what happens is the rich ruleth over the poor. You say, how do they do that? Well, they take their money, and they make money off of their money. And they do that by lending it to you. And then they charge you an exorbitant amount of interest rate, which is almost considered like highway robbery, especially when it comes to credit cards. You take credit cards and you get a 15%, 20%, 25% interest, uh, and then you get the late fees associated with it and the things that happen, and uh, you'll never get out of debt. <laughs> it is absolutely um, uh, insane what comes along with that. And they have mastered it to keep you on the hamster wheel when it comes to those things. And so uh, if you can't handle your finances, you've got no business messing around with a credit card. A credit card, uh, if you use it properly and use it right, it can, be, it can be a tool, a useful tool. I've got about, I don't know, five or six of them, and I've got no balances on any of them. I don't owe them anything. And so you say, why do you do that? Because if you have a credit card, you use it, you can get points, uh, you can use that thing and you pay it off uh, before it comes due and then you won't have any fees, you won't have any interest and you use it as a tool. And you use that thing as a tool. Um, I've had people say they use their debit card, for example, and they take their debit card and they take it overseas and they pull money out of uh, uh, an ATM and that ATM's got a, uh, um, uh, got a little um, microchip in it there and it collects your PIN number and uh, then it, it clones your card uh, and your debit card and it empties your bank account. Guess what? If you're using a credit card, they're emptying somebody else's bank account and you're not on the hook for it. And there's protections in place. So if you use a, use a credit card and you go overseas and you use that, 
um, and then they steal from that credit card, they're not stealing your money. They're stealing that company's money, and you're protected. And so there's reasons to have, some people are like so against it, like, oh, I should never have a credit card. No, there's reasons for having them. Uh, and an, another good reason is an emergency. You might uh, find yourself out somewhere away, away from home and have to use one in an emergency, and it's good to have one. This day and time, uh, it's hard to rent a hotel room even without a credit card. Uh, if you try to do it with a debit card, they won't let you do it a lot of the times. <laughs> They said, oh, we need to put a hold on your credit card. And they said, well, here's a debit card. And they said, we, don't, we can't accept that for, for the hold. We need, a, we need a credit card. And so I've been in those situations. So it <clears throat> doesn't say you can live without them, but if you are not good with your finances and you're prone to go into debt, uh, when I first started using them when I was younger, I would go, go and spend the money thinking, it, you know, hey, they gave me a $500 limit when I first started. You know, happy days. Then you go run up the $500, but I found out something. You have to pay it back. <laughs> now, and the bill starts coming in. And they say, you can make the minimum payment, $19 a month, and you'll have it paid off when you're 62. <laughs> Seen those before? <laughs> Whew. And so uh, the best thing is, is if you're not any good with, with that, um, don't do it. Now, I teach on finances, and if you use debt wisely and leverage debt, uh, not everybody's of this persuasion, but if you leverage debt and you use it uh, as an investment, all the rich people in the world, you say, what do they do with debt? They use it to their advantage. Um, Elon Musk, when he went to go buy Twitter and changed it to X and all of that, he, he's the richest man in the world. You know what he did? He went and borrowed the money to buy it. You say, why did he do that? Because it's a tax write-off. If you know how to do it. If you don't know how to do it, stay away from it. But if you know how to use it and leverage it, and invest and do things with it, then use it to your advantage. Because it's better to use somebody else's money, and that's what, that's what people do. But um, what I'm talking about primarily is when uh, you shouldn't be using a credit card to go, um, you know, and you're going to pay it off later, go buy dinner and pay $100 for dinner, uh, you know, and you go have tea somewhere at a nice restaurant and swipe the credit card. You do that about 10 times, and you're 1000 bucks in debt. And you're like, how am I going to pay this off? And, and you're going to get in trouble, and you're going to be worried about it and stressed about it. Frivolous uh, debt, you have to be careful, because the borrower becomes servant to the lender. And next thing you know, the reason you're living, the reason you're going to work is to pay off debt, and you can't ever seem to catch up because they're charging you 20 25% interest. And you, you, I mean, you'll, you'll run that hamster wheel till it comes off because you can't ever get ahead. And it's very important that you stay away from debt altogether. You say, what, well, what do I do if I want to go to a restaurant and eat? Eat at home. And if you don't have the money to go pay for it up front, don't go put it on a credit card and go in debt for it. That's not wise. Learn to live below. So some people say learn to live within your means. I say learn to live below your means. Uh, I, I learned to do that. Uh, you say, I'm passionate about this because I got in debt when I was um, about 16 years old. I remember I was able to get debt about that time. And I remember I was about $18,000 in debt, just like in the blink of an eye. Uh, I went and borrowed money for a car. I had a credit card, like I said, and I thought, oh, this money, they're giving it to you. You don't have to pay it back. It doesn't work that way. And uh, so it took me, <clears throat> I remember getting in debt and it just paying it off the minimums and just trying to survive and stay afloat and just keep my head above water. And no matter what I was doing and how much I was paying, uh, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even make any headway to start paying the stuff off. Some of you have been in that position before, especially some of you older ones know what I'm talking about. And you know I'm telling the young people that are listening if they'll listen the truth. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. Amen. Amen. And that's the best way to do it. Now, when you, get, uh, of, of the, when you get to the point where you can control your finances and you can handle a credit card, that's different. Use it to your advantage. Don't abuse it. Use it as a tool. Don't abuse it. And, uh, and, and don't go in debt. So, oh, I need a new pair of shoes. I've got, I, I've got shoes in my closet that are 14 years old, and I still wear them. They're not much to look at, but they get the job done. Some people can't go six months. They can't even go three months. I've got to have the latest pair of Air Jordans. 
And what do they do? Swipe, swipe. I've got to have the latest, greatest car. I've got to have the latest, greatest uh, technology that's out there. And you go into debt for it. That's not wise. It's not wise to, to take this consumer debt. And then the next thing you know, you're stressed out. You're angry at the world because of the position you put yourself in. So don't play with that debt. Don't go into it. Oh, no man, anything. Don't be a, a, um, a servant uh, to the rich, because that's the context of verse 7. The rich poor over the, uh, ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And so make sure that, um, that you watch that very, very carefully. And uh, your budget may be, might be able to handle the debt better than your spirit can. So I can pay this back. Just because you can make a repayment doesn't mean you can afford it. You say, I can make that repayment. You drive by and that car is there on the lot and you start licking your lips. That car lot, oh, I can pay $55 a week. They don't tell you it's for seven years. And the car's worn out after two. Then you've got five years left to make on the, pay, pay on the car and the car's worn out and gone to the junkyard, the wrecking yard. You better watch that. You'd be better off taking public transport and being able to sleep at night. Amen. Instead of getting in the debt up to your eyeballs and impressing uh, people with your flash car that you got for $55 a week. If you can even get a car like that, uh, it probably wouldn't impress very many people in that range. But um, there was an old saying that said, uh, you, you, use, you buy things you don't need with money that you don't have with debt to impress people you don't like. That's the position a lot of people are in. And so you say, who are you trying to impress? You, a lot of people do that for their ego. They go into debt for their ego. They, they, get a, they buy a house, they buy a car, they buy clothes and bags and shoes to impress people with their ego, and they go in debt, and it's a vicious cycle instead of living below your means. You say, what do you mean by below your means? That means if you live within your means, that means you're spending all your means. You need to learn to live below that so you can take some money and have it as what they call disposable income or some you can save and put aside and learn how to live below your means. That's really a wise thing to do. And if you, have, if you learn to live below your means instead of maxing everything out, just because you can live a certain lifestyle doesn't mean that you should. If you drop back down and take some humility in life and learn some frugality and learn to uh, shop around, you know, just, just changing places where you shop, going from like Woolies or Coles and down to Aldi and doing some shopping there, maybe not all of it, and do, just making that switch. My family and I, man, the crunch lately, we've had to do that. We, we can't just go willy-nilly and say, okay, we're going to take this shopping list and go in and buy the, the groceries. We have, to, we have to go and shop around. We have to watch when the specials come and like when they're, they're discounted and, and shop around and go to the fruit shop and, and do that. Uh, you say, why? Because if you don't, somebody's making money off of you. <laughs> And if they're going to make money off of me, I'm going to make it hard for them. You say, why? Because the, the Bible talks about the, the substance of a, um, a laboring man in a, is precious. And you, you take that what God gives you and it's precious to you. Just don't turn it loose uh, and just you know frivolously throw it in the air and go here and there. You shop around, you do your due diligence before you go do that. And you make sure that uh, when the specials come on and you can get things that are in season, it's good for your health and it's good for your wallet. And make sure you, you, you shop around and do those things that are proper. And it'll help you with your spirit. So don't owe. Uh, watch, those, watch that credit. Watch that debt. Uh, continuing on, uh, look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. That was O, and then the next one we're going to go to is W, which is don't worry. Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Now these things, uh, they're easy to mention. They're easier said than done, okay? I say don't O, don't... And listen, if you're in debt, there is, a, there is hope and there is a way out. Like I told you, I meant to say this before, uh, when I was 16... Um, I was in debt for several years and just trying to pay what I could 
And I really wasn't focused on it. I was just trying to keep my head above water. And I, I made up my heart and mind that I was going to pay this off. And it took me three solid years of, of basically living like a homeless person to pay off the debt and get out of debt. But I remember the day I made the last payment and I was out of debt. And I was about, I was, remember I was in Bible school and I was in my second year of Bible school. And I don't remember what month it was or, or nothing like that. But I remember the day that I wrote the check or made the last payment to get out of debt. And since then, I haven't been in debt since. Those, those lessons learned the hardest last the longest. And you learn that. And I never want that feeling again. I never want to be in that position again. So there's some hope for you that if you are in debt and, and uh, you, you find yourself there, you say, what do you do? Make a plan to get out of it. Uh, and if you, you say, Pastor, I don't know how to even start. Come talk to me. I've been there and done that and unfortunately bought the T-shirt and know all about it, know a little bit about it. So maybe I could help you with some things that I've learned uh, when it comes to that and say, I just need some help to sit down. And you say, I'm hopeless, I'm beyond hope. You might be surprised what you can and can do if, if maybe you just haven't thought of it or not looked into it. And if you do need some help with that, I'd be glad to sit down with you and, and impart to you what I know. It might not be much, but maybe it can help you uh, to get the ball rolling. And uh, there's, there's uh, just uh, something you can look up, but there's a snowball effect when it comes to that. That's where you go in and you, you figure out the way to take the highest, um, the one that's got the highest interest rate, and you pay that off first. And, that, and, and once that's paid off, it's a snowball. You take all the money you were paying on that and you put it on the next bill, and that snowballs into that, and it gets getting bigger and bigger. And the more money you free up, it just keeps eating and chewing up those other debts until they're all gone. That's the method that I used to pay off all of my debt. And, uh, you know, it was only a little over 20000 I think, or twenty five when I paid it. But that took me, that took me, you know, when you're paying rent and your insurance and all the things you have to pay, there's not much left over. And then you've got to take that what's left over to tackle that debt. It seems hopeless and frustrating at times. But I've been there before, and I know the Lord can help you to get out of that. Amen? And God did it for me. He can do the same for you. And sometimes you just have to admit you need some help and need some guidance and counsel. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety for that. Amen? Uh, Philippians 4.6. Philippians 4.6. The Bible says, we'll back up just a little bit. Uh, Philippians 4, look at verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you know what the enemy is to uh, having an angry spirit and having, uh, having that anger control you? Peace. Peaceful people are not angry people. They don't coexist in the same space, in the same place. When you have peace uh, with the Lord, when you have the peace, the Bible says, and the peace of God which passeth understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you let that peace of God rule in you, it's beyond understanding and it will stomp out and stamp out that anger and that spirit. And you will be slow to anger. It won't be something that you won't be able to control because the peace of God is something that's ruling in your heart. Um, of these four things we mentioned here, worry is probably the least admitted uh, underlying cause of anger. People don't like to admit it. But when you blow up and then recover, you can usually admit to, oh man, I was just stressed out or I had too much to do, or I drank too much coffee today, or I haven't eaten in a while, or I'm just overwhelmed uh, with these bills, or one of, one of many um, excuses you might use. But we rarely admit that the reason that we lost it and got angry and, and blew our testimony is that we'd been worrying about something. That worry wears on you when you carry it, and when you walk with it, it, it wears on you. And I suppose that a lot of the times that God's people are too ashamed to admit that there was nothing bad going on. We simply worked ourselves up uh, over a matter that ultimately won't turn out to be as bad as we convinced ourselves it was. In our mind, it's a lot bigger in our minds than it is in real life. 
Uh, do you know people, uh, there was statistics of worry where people worry and then they, they trialed the, some of the worst worriers and the things that they worried about. And they, they did something like 90, not, I think it was either 98 or 99% of the things that they worried about never came to pass. <sighs> so in your mind, you go to this place and you think, well, what if this happens? What if my kids are dead in a ditch somewhere? And I'm worried about my kids and I'm worried about the, the finances and I'm worried about my health and I'm worried about this. And Dr. Google says, I've got five minutes left to live. I need to call and get my affairs in order. You know? And all these things you worry about, and they don't come to pass. And then you have to, you know, you don't like paying. A, I don't know about you, but if I ever get a bill in the mail and I've paid the bill, uh, if they send me another bill for the exact same thing, I call them up and say, I'm not paying you twice. I've paid you once. I've got the receipt here. I'm not paying you twice. You know what worry is? Worry is you're paying for it twice, but you never bought it the first time. <laughs> you're paying for it twice. It, because... At first, you don't know if it's going to happen. You're worrying about something that may not ever happen. And then if it does happen, you're paying for it twice. Sometimes three times because you won't let it go and you keep worrying about it. Wait till the bill comes. <laughs> or the tragedy or the trouble and God will give you grace to get through it. Worrying about it's not going, it's in vain. It's a waste of time. And so don't, uh, don't waste your time uh, with that. Brother Sam... Would, not to stop anything, but I just saw somebody go by there. Would you just check and make sure that we're all good in the car park? Thank you. Um, and so when it comes to these things, it's, it's important that you have the peace of God. Look at uh, John chapter 14, verse 27. John 14 and verse 27. When it comes to worry, uh, I'm going to uh, help you look at it from the, from the view of pe having peace. And if you've got the Lord's peace, the Bible says there, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So when it comes to worry, uh, we've got a sign above our um, kitchen or our dining table there, and you look up on the wall and uh, above the door, and it says, Why worry when you can pray? And it's just a little saying, but it's the truth. You say, what should you be doing as a Christian? Instead of worrying, you should take the same energy that you have and commit it to the Lord in prayer. Which one's valuable? Which one's going to uh, yield fruit and results? Worry is not going to do anything. It's a fu futile exercise. But prayer works. Amen. Prayer will get, will, will, will turn and move the hand of God and the heart of God and change situations and it will help. Amen? So be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Uh, look at John chapter 14 and verse 27. John 14 verse 27. The Bible says, here's Jesus speaking, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Amen? Give I unto you, let not your heart be what? Troubled. Troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isn't that the definition of worry? Having a troubled heart, having an anxious heart, having a, uh, having a spirit of being afraid and fear. And that's, what, that's really the definition of worry. That's the uh, layout of it. And so as Christians, we should be able to walk in the peace that Jesus Christ gave us. But what fights against that is worry and anxiety and stress and those things. His peace is far better than any peace that the world gives. His peace keeps your heart from being troubled, the Bible says there. So why do we encounter some things that trouble us so much that they keep us from walking in this peace? You say, why don't we have peace? You say, well, I believe Christians are filling their minds with the problem rather than staying their minds on the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter number uh, 26. Isaiah chapter 26, Old Testament, Isaiah 26, Isaiah chapter 26, and look there at verse number 3. Isaiah 26 and verse 3, the Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. You know, that's the only time in your whole Bible that that, that, that phrase is mentioned, perfect peace peace. You think it'd be something that you'd pay attention to. And I'd memorize that verse if I was you. Thou will keep him in peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth 
in thee. Amen. You worry warts, you better get that verse and memorize it. Put that verse there to remind you, to help you keep your mind on the Lord and to trust in the Lord. Amen. That'll help you. Thou will keep anything that consumes us. I had it happen to me yesterday. I had it happen to me. You say, oh, you're, you're invincible to this stuff, Pastor. No, I'm not. These things still happen to me. I have to be uh, reminded of them as well. I had my heart, my mind set on something, and it didn't come to pass. Like oh, It didn't work out. And, man, I was... I was focused on how I could fix the problem, how I could go about it different, how I could do this. And the Lord just said, I, you need my peace. And I didn't have peace because the Lord offered it, but I didn't want his peace right then. I wanted to be in control. I wanted to fix the problem. I wanted to approach it from a different way. And that worry and that stress and that anxiety crept up and it was there. So yeah, I struggle with it too. And I have to be reminded of these things often. Uh, and, and you say, why? Because I was zeroed in on that problem. And you have to watch it. Don't zero in on it. Don't do that. You, you, uh, you just have to say, I'm not going to think about that right now. I'm going to quit thinking about that. Uh, but it's all you can think about. You go to sleep thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. And that problem is there. And your emotional frame of mind is you'll not have peace and rest until this problem is solved. None of you else have that problem. I do. <laughs> And, and I get tunnel vision when it comes to things sometimes. But can I say this? Your emotional frame of mind is you'll not have peace, but you're supposed to be... Some problems, I'll say this, some problems don't go away for a long time. Some problems are not resolved. Some issues are, going, are here to stay. And they're not going anywhere. And, and when you are in your pride... And in your arrogance, thinking to yourself, you're going to fix this. When the Lord says, no, you're not. This is settled down in your life. This issue, this problem, it's here to stay for a while. They used to say about storms. Uh, you know, the old timers, I'd talk to them and they'd say, well, it's here to stay. What, what in the world are they talking about? They knew enough about the weather before there was the weather channel and before you could check it on your phone to know there were certain indicators that this storm, this, this storm was going to be here for a while. It was going to just settle down, just get used to the pitter-patter of the rain and the wind because it's not going anywhere for a while. It's here to stay for a little while. And man, you keep looking out the window, you keep uh, hoping for the sun, you keep hoping for the, the dry, and the storm's there to stay. And it goes by one day and two days and three days. And you go by a week and it's still there and two weeks and it's still there. Boy, I, I felt like over the last three years, the rain was never going to stop in Sydney. Anybody else felt like that? And they're saying it's El, El Nino, Nina and all this and that. I'm just saying, man, I'm hoping for the sun. And, and it just the, the rain just would not let up. And they said, well, it was back to back and they're thinking it's going to be a third year. I'm like, good riddance. I was ready for the, the sun and the, the dry to be back. I don't know about you, but yeah, it was there for a while. And that's what happens in life. You have these problems. You have these things come up. And I remember Brother Cody, when he comes to Australia, he said, well, he said, I think I have a frog in my throat. And he's crossed his legs and sat down. And he's here to stay. And I think about that with problems. Sometimes they're here to stay. They're here to stay for a while. And they're not going to go. But if you keep thinking about the problem, it's not going to solve it. You say, what is that? That's man and his ego and pride and flesh thinking, I can solve this. I can solve my work situation. I can solve my home situation. I can solve this. Lord, if you just give me the right time, I can solve it. And in your own strength, you just keep pounding your head against the wall. And when you finish, the wall's bloody and the wall hasn't moved. But your head's bleeding all over the place. And, and you didn't solve the problem. So you say, what's the result? So what the solution is, you fill your mind and your thoughts of the Lord. Your emotions may be ragged from the mental gymnastics that you've been playing, but don't worry about how you feel. In time, your feelings will catch up with your thoughts of the Lord, and they'll change even if the problem doesn't, and you'll have peace. You say, what do you mean by that? See in that verse, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. 
His mind, your mind is not on the problem, it's on the Lord. You keep your mind on the Lord where it belongs. You keep your mind, Lord, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about heaven. I, I'm thinking about when you're going to give Jesus Christ the green light to come and get us down here. Lord, my mind and heart is stayed on thee. And you know what? When you start thinking about the Lord instead of thinking about your problem or problems, plural, that's when the peace comes. When you start looking at world politics, you start seeing what's going on in Israel and Lebanon and Iran and Iraq and Yemen and all these places around the world, especially the Middle East. And you start looking at it and you start, how's this going to affect? And they're already talking about it. It's going to affect the world market, says the war rages on and, and inflation is going to get worse and the economy is going to keep, continue to go down and these things are going to happen. And you say, what happens? Your mind's off the Lord. But when you get your mind back on the Lord, you say, well, Lord, you said that in the last days, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And before you come, Lord, you said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And Lord, this means, this means you're coming sooner. Amen. And the time's drawing nigh. Amen. And these problems I've got, the Antichrist can pay the, pay the debts. Amen. He can have it. Keep your mind stayed on the Lord, amen? It'll put a smile on your face. That doesn't mean you don't pay your bills, but you just you keep working at it. And, uh, and uh, if the Lord comes, you know you don't have a problem tonight that, uh, that wouldn't be solved if the Lord Jesus Christ would come. He'd solve every single problem you have if He'd just come. Lord, even so, come Lord Jesus, amen? See how if you change your state of mind and you, you put it where it belongs, whose mind is stayed on thee. Like Velcro, just, uh, we've got a little dog, a little pug. They call him a Velcro dog. And I didn't understand what that meant when we first got him. But that's, you keep reading about it and that's what they call them. Velcro dogs are dogs that they won't leave your side. If, they're, if they're, they can get to you, they're stuck to you like Velcro. And everywhere you go, he's there wanting something to eat. He, you can't feed him enough. He's a little butterball. Just eat, 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 eat. And uh, if he's outside, he's looking in like, let me get to you. I want to be in. I want to be next to you. I'm sitting there at the table and doing my devotions, and I'm reading. He's sitting on both my feet. He's stuck to me. And uh, that's, that's, what, that's the way we need to be to the Lord, just looking to our master. We need to be stuck like Velcro to the Lord and, and mind stayed on, on the Lord. Amen. Uh, you say, what happens? Christians, they lose their peace because they attack the problem rather than trusting the Lord. Uh, look there in verse um, uh, 20, chapter 26 and verse number 3. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You say, what happens? With the problem, the Christians don't, they, they, and, and I'm one of them too, they don't trust the Lord in the problem. You see, your mind needs to be stayed on the Lord, but you need to trust the Lord with the problem. When you stay your mind on the Lord, He gives you the verses of Scripture and counsel to follow, and you know what to do because He tells you. However, rather than trust the Lord, you rely on what, uh, what He said. You keep, instead of relying on what He said, you keep taking matters back into your own hands. You keep trying to solve the problem. You keep attacking the problem. You keep meddling with the circumstances. The Bible says, trust in the Lord instead. Lord, I'm taking my hands off. I can't do anything about this. I've tried. And here's the thing. God knows you tried. And you, some of you have tried, and you've tried, and you've tried to fix the problem or the circumstance. And no matter how much you meddle with it, it hasn't budged, it hasn't moved, it hasn't gone anywhere. So you know what you have to learn? Lord, this is not a problem I can solve. I need to take my hands off and trust you to take care of it. Amen? And if you don't do that, you're going to continue to worry. The Bible says, we won't turn there for sake of time, but in Psalm 118, verse 8, the Bible says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord. He knows the minutest details of your problem and can do things to address it uh, that no man on this earth can do. Did you know that? Give him some time to work his plan and just trust him through it. If he needs you to do something about the problem, he'll show you and he'll tell you what to do. In the meantime, let him deal with it. Trust him and you'll see the peace come. Keep your mind stayed on him and trust in him. Amen? 
And continuing on with that thought, the Bible says uh, in Psalm 165, 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law. Now we usually quote the other half of the verse, And nothing shall offend thee. But if you take the first half of that verse before the comma, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law. Christians are, are hating the problem that they're in. and They're hating the circumstances that God has them in the season of life they're in instead of loving His Word. You see? And that gets you into trouble. Dealing with a problem affects your emotions in powerful ways. You get angry. You get frustrated. You get bitter. Lord, you can do something about this. Yeah, but it's not in my timetable. It's better for you if I wait a week. The Lord knows it's better for you if He waits 10 days. He knows it's better for your circumstance and your life, twofold, threefold, fiftyfold. If you have some patience to wait, God will come through and work it out in such a way that you'll say, Whoa, I'm glad He did that at that time. Amen? But you get angry and frustrated, and at times you think you might go crazy <laughs> dealing with the, these things and this worry. You become so emotionally distressed that you don't feel the love that you had for the Lord or for His Word as you once did. Instead, you say, what happens? You feel resentment and hatred toward whoever is adding to your pain. And that anger continues to grow. It sure happens. You may read the Bible, but you're not loving what you're reading. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law. Do you wake up in the morning... Just like you did when you fell in love with your spouse and you looked to run to God's Word as His love letter to you. And you said, man, I love that Bible. I love God's Word. The Bible says you'll have peace. Some of you are worried. You say, you say what's a direct antidote to that? Fall in love with God's words. Great peace have they which love thy law. Love it. Fall in love with it again. Maybe you've fallen out of love with it. You know, God's Word hasn't changed and God hasn't changed. And I remember the story of the, uh, in the States, and you might have the, a, a truck or a ute like this, but you have the bench seat in the front. This is probably the uh, older days now going back. You'd have that bench seat across and three people could sit in the, in the truck, you know, in that ute. And uh, a, a young man, which they, gr they grew old together, but... The young man uh, turned into an older man, and the young lady, they got married, you know, and they're uh, in their late teens, early 20s, and when they first got married, she sat right in the middle of that truck, right next to her husband. And for 40, you know, years they'd been married, and, and uh, after 40 years, you know, they're driving down the road, and she's sitting over there by the window, and he's sitting over there driving the truck, and... Um, they drive by a young couple that just got married. They got the same sort of truck with the bench seat there and said, the wife commented and said, look there, honey. There's a young couple that's in love and they just got married. And see, she's sitting right next to her husband there. Isn't that sweet? Why don't we do that anymore? And the man said, honey, I haven't moved. I haven't moved. You say, what did he mean by that? He was, he was telling the truth. You know what? With the Lord, the Lord hasn't moved. And God's Word hasn't changed. If the love is slipping, it's slipping on our part and not on His. He hasn't changed. His character hasn't changed. His nature, His love for you hasn't diminished one iota. He still loves you as much as the first day you got saved. Amen? He loves you with, the Bible says, with an everlasting love. Amen? What a thing. And so if something's gone wrong, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24, around about verse uh, uh, 13 there, it says, When iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. You know what is a direct re relation to your, your lo loss of love for the Lord and loss of love for the Word of God? Probably as sin abounds in your heart and life. It's sort of like a, a balanced beam where the love goes down and the sin increases. You have to get that thing right so you can fall in love with the Lord and His Word all the, all the way over again. Get your mind back on the Lord and trust Him. When you love God's words and love these words again, you start believing God's Word again. If you think about it, unbelief is at the root 
of the lack of peace that you might have. Trust what the Lord said. If you do, you won't uh, read because you have to. God forbid you get up in the morning and say, Oh, I have to read my Bible today. No, you get to. God's given you His Word. That's special. That's, that's important. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. But you cast it aside because your, your love has waned. You don't have peace because you don't love God's Word. And you, you say instead, have worry. You worry through life. You worry about the bills. You worry about family. You worry about this. And the Bible lays there just collecting dust. Dust it off. Get those tears of joy back on its pages. Fall back in love with God's words. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You'll worry, Wart. You're not spending time in God's word and loving it like you should. It's in direct opposition to that. Next thing I'd like to say, and I'm just about done, Christians are loading their cares upon themselves and worrying rather than casting their cares upon Jesus. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down. 1 Peter 5, 7, the Bible says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. We read in Philippians 4, it said, Be careful for nothing. Right? So how can I do that? I'm careful about this, and I'm full of care about this, and I'm full of care about that, and I'm full of care about this one and that one, and how can I, how can I do that? Well... You're full of care over your problem. It's weighing you down so heavy you can't, you just keep adding to the load. You say, what do you do? You recognize the load's too heavy for you to carry. Well, you know, I had to learn this lesson in 1 Peter 5, 7 as, as, a, as being the position I'm in as a pastor. I had to learn uh, this lesson. Because not only, when you become a pastor, not only are you, are you trying to carry your own uh, cares, but you're carrying the cares of the congregation. You're carrying the cares of your wife and your children and your loved ones. And then the, the Apostle Paul said daily the care of all the churches. And then not just our church. I'm in contact with Brother Rodney and Brother Danny. And now uh, down in Melbourne and Brother, Brother Dave over in the Philippines. And as the ministry grows and as these things grow, all these cares. And I'm crushed at times underneath it because I'm not Superman. I'm just flesh and blood. And, and the, the Bible talked about Elijah there in, in James. He said he was a man subject to like passions such as we are. But he prayed, right, that it would not rain upon the earth. God answered his prayer. So that tells us if we cast our cares on the Lord, even as sim, simple, sinful men, God hears, answers, and he'll carry those burdens with us and he'll carry those burdens for us. And I cast my care on the Lord. And when you bring to me a care that I can't carry, I cast it to the Lord. And say, Lord, can you carry this for me? You know what my children do when something's too heavy for them? They try. They'll pick up that grocery bag from, from Woolies or Coles or Aldi. And they'll pick it up, especially Ariel and Jesse. And they'll, they'll pick it up and go, Urgh! and they'll give it their best shot. And they'll carry it one foot. Say, Dad, I can't carry this anymore. Can you help carry this, Dad? Sure. And you take, you know what? No matter how many bags I've got, I reach down and I grab theirs too. And my little girl, Ariel, she says, oh, Dad, you're so strong. <laughs> it impresses her. I can't impress anybody else, but I can impress her. <laughs> Amen. And she'll grab my bicep and squeeze it. Dad, you're so strong. <laughs> that makes me perk up a little bit. <laughs> you know what? You can reach up to the everlasting arms of God Almighty. And say, Lord, I can't carry this. But you can. You're so strong. And I trust you. And I'm going to keep trusting you. And no matter how many bags he carries, he carries all the problems of the world and all the prayers. He can still handle yours. Amen. Amen. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And you'll be amazed how the peace will come when you cast it on to the Lord. And we'll stop there for tonight. And just help you think on these things and, and hope some of it helps you and something, some resonates with you. Be slow to anger. Don't stress. Don't lust. Don't owe and don't worry. Amen. Don't worry.